there was one place on this earth that was absolutely perfect, and it was a garden. The Garden of Eden. Very good, the Garden of Eden. And the story that we're going to hear about in the Garden of Eden comes from the book of Genesis. In the what? Bible. The Bible. Very good. In the Bible. For those Christians who believe their Bible is the Word of God, the literal truth, one man is held up as the Antichrist, Charles Darwin, for leading millions of Christians astray with a very different account of creation. Evolution by natural selection. It seems outrageous to them that Darwin was laid to rest here in Westminster Abbey, the highest honor the Church of England could offer. I cannot remember that I have ever published a word directly against religion or the clergy. because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's Word, the Holy Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Evolution, I believe, is a way for the atheist to devise a method of how we got here, and it wasn't by God, and it was all by accident. If the theory of evolution is a fact, this Bible must be false, and we're all stupid ignoramuses. My friend, it takes more faith to believe in a theory, an unproven theory, than to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. I think one of the major questions we run into today is, uh, is evolution really compatible uh, with biblical Christianity? And I believe the answer is just unquestionably no. There's no dispute. God has determined what is true, and he's told us what he did in Genesis, the order in which he did it, and he expects us to believe it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life. And God said, let us make man in our image Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. According to the latest Gallup poll, 46% of Americans believe the Genesis account of creation. All right, now look right out here at me and smile. 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 Now look up at the dinosaurs in that window. Look afraid. Look very afraid. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden. At no time in the past 300 years has there been such a concerted effort in support of a literal interpretation of the Bible, and especially the Genesis account of Adam and Eve and a six-day creation. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And he took one of his ribs and made it into a woman. Creationism is the fastest growing branch of Christianity, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. I choose to believe that the Bible is the Word of God and it contains first and second hand witnesses of these events, so I can believe it so much more than I can believe the secular scientists who weren't there to see these things. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said two plus two equals five, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it 
accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. I can't even fathom coming from this little thing that crawled on the ground to apes to being human. It, it just doesn't, it, it sounds crazy to me. When you have generations of people being taught that evolution's fact and therefore Genesis is not true and you have to reinterpret the Bible, why shouldn't we do what we want to do? There's no absolutes, therefore we determine what is right and what is wrong. In the Creation Museum, when we walk into Graffiti Alley, it's to represent a culture where one has taken away a foundation and absolutes. So why not abort a human being? After all, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids, what is the difference? Why shouldn't marriage be two men, two women, or whatever you want to make it to be? I think that Darwin knew. I think he knew. What I'm teaching is going to have a profound effect on mankind. And it's the kind of effect that moves people away from trusting God, trusting the God of the Bible, into trusting man and the words of man. And he made a decision. I'm going on with this. Considering how fiercely I've been attacked, it seems ludicrous that I once intended to be a clergyman. I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible, and soon persuaded myself that our creed must be fully accepted. The blood of Christ. I don't believe he did believe all of the Bible. He didn't really believe in six literal days of creation. You assume those days of creation are ordinary days, and you take those genealogies in the Bible, you can only get approximately 6,000 years. You can't get millions of years. If the idea of millions of years hadn't been popularized in the late 18th, early 19th century, Darwin could never have popularized his ideas of evolution. No person of the first rank in professional geological circles in Darwin's day to whom he was exposed believed that the Earth was very, very recently created uh, with life on Earth in six 24-hour days. You have to think about the 19th century as a period of enormous digging. If you think about the canal systems, if you think about the building work, the laying of gas, the building of railways, this is a landscape that was being dug up. Everywhere, fossils were coming up. Really extraordinary things like mammoths and plesiosaurs. That gave evidence of very, very early life forms in the very lowest rock strata, which people were now beginning to understand as being deep time. Um, but also an enormous diversity of species that, ha that was no longer represented on the Earth at all. So enormous numbers of extinct species. Um, and people had to make sense of that. And you couldn't make sense of it within the time frame that the church was promoting. Darwin didn't work with any geologist who doubted that the Earth was unimaginably old and full of the relics of extinct animals. At Cambridge, his role models were clerical naturalists. These men were devout, they were ethically upright, they were professionally ambitious, and they did science for the glory of God. And it was from them Darwin learnt his ambition in science, and then came his chance to sail around the world on HMS Beagle. It took five years, started just three months after he graduated from Cambridge, when he really was rather idly wondering what to do with his life. He was invited on board, not as a naturalist, but as the gentleman companion to the captain. The voyage of the Beagle was the most important voyage ever taken. What I find reading Darwin's own accounts is his excitement, his delight, his love in the natural world. He was in a kind of paradise. Among the scenes which have deeply impressed on my mind, none exceeded in sublimity the primeval forests, undefaced by the hand of man, temples filled with the varied productions of the god of nature. No one can stand in these solitudes unmoved and not feel there is more to man than the mere breath of his body.
In this voyage, which was nearly five years, the longest stretch of time Darwin spent on board was, I think, 48 days. And he never wasted an opportunity. As soon as the ship came into port, he'd buy a horse, rent a horse, uh, sometimes with companions, sometimes on his own, and go up high into the foothills of the Andes or around the coast, looking at coastal formations, into deserts, all the time, describing, 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 noting it down. He regarded it as his duty to do this. This was why he was there, and he wasn't going to waste an hour of his time idling around. Uh, he must go and explore that rock face and see what he could find there. Darwin wasn't just interested in the crust of the Earth and the formation of its features. He was interested in the remains of life within that crust, extinct animals. Every new landscape that he saw, every new bit of scenery, every new diversity of species group gave him more and more evidence that, no, this didn't happen in one great snap of creation. These extraordinary mountains and lakes and coastal landscapes had all shifted imperceptibly over millions and millions of years. But while all this was happening, Darwin was experiencing profound changes within himself. Darwin had left the comforts of his upper-class English existence, and for the first time in his life, he was faced with extraordinary violence and cruelty. When he was in Chile, there was a major earthquake, and his whole comprehension of the world changed. The solid earth, our foundation of our life, is shuddering, and as he later discovers, in a day or so later, in Concepcion, there's been huge suffering. The cathedral at Concepcion has collapsed, burying in its rubble many devout worshippers. He must have begun to think, there's something arbitrary here. Th this is not uh, a, a loving God. Probably the most shattering episode during the voyage was his encounter with slavery. He had read all about slavery, Darwin had, um, and then on the Beagle voyage, he set foot in Brazil and he saw it in the raw, torn flesh. He encountered instruments of torture. He saw grown men cowering in fear. He saw children abused by their masters. He was profoundly affected by what some humans were capable of doing to other humans whom they regarded as animals. It makes one's blood boil, yet heart tremble, to think that we Englishmen and our American descendants with their boastful cry of liberty have been and are so guilty. Darwin's empathy was for all suffering creatures. I cannot see, as plainly as others do, and as I should wish to do, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the Ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. Now, if his professors had taught him that this world is not the way it used to be, that it changed because of sin, maybe if he had been taught the truth about the history in Genesis, he would have responded differently to the death and suffering issue. We are bearing, bearing the brunt of Adam's sin, and it's very difficult, and the Lord tells us to love each other and bear each other's burdens, and that's what we try to do here at Haven of Rest. God cares for us. Give your cares. Let God deal with those cares. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, yet though he die, he shall live. Do you believe that? He will save you. 
We have about 170 people come in here for dinner. A large percentage of those ask for shelter as well. Those are the ones that are truly homeless. So many of them have been through sexual abuse, um, neglect, um, you have turned to alcohol and drugs for who knows what reason. Some of them have even shared with us that this is a last resort. A lot of people ask how a loving God can allow so many evil and painful things to happen. I don't believe there is any clear-cut answer because we don't understand the mind of God for one thing. However, the Lord does not do things without a purpose. Some of the trials we go through will strengthen us and give us wisdom. We don't usually learn strength and wisdom and faith through having it easy. We learn the most through trials. But also, we live in a fallen world. Back in Genesis, it talks about how it didn't start out that way, but because of the decision that man made, because the, the angel of light, Lucifer, was there and tempted him. We live in a fallen world now, and so these awful things do happen. Find your thing, it'll find your Christmas. All the death and suffering we see here isn't a result of a creator God. It's sin that's the cause of what we see here. So the whole point of this room is to get across to Christians and non-Christians. It's not God's fault there's death and suffering in the world. It's our fault because we sinned in Adam. After all that he had experienced, Darwin could no longer accept the simple biblical explanation for cruelty and suffering. But by now, Something else was taking shape in his mind, something much more dangerous. In September 1835, four years after leaving England, the Beagle dropped anchor off some little-known islands, the Galapagos. Here we seem to be brought somewhere near to that great fact, the mystery of mystery the first appearance of new beings on this earth. What Darwin noticed, most of all, was that the animals and plants on the Galapagos were rather like the uh, animals and plants on the mainland of South America, but they were slightly different from them. Now, if it was just being on islands that made them different, Cape Verdes and Galapagos should have looked the same, but they didn't. They looked more like their neighbors. Why was that? Darwin realized that what must have happened is that a small sample of creatures, including many birds and the like, reached these new conditions and changed slowly over time. In other words, they'd evolved. At that time, he'd no idea how or why. As he catalogued his species on the journey home, he scribbled the first tentative notes on the possibility of evolution. If there's the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of the archipelagos would be well worth examining, for such facts would undermine the stability of the species. Evolution was a dangerous idea, and only bad people, such as French atheists, materialists, free thinkers, would dare to speculate that species had naturally arisen in the course of time. He knew that he had to confine his thoughts to private notebooks. And it would take seven years of intensive research before he felt ready to write to a trusted friend. At last, gleams of light have come. And I'm almost convinced, quite contrary to the opinion I started with, that species are not immutable. It is like confessing a murder. What he has done is worse than murder. I am saddened for Charles Darwin, being led astray from the real truth and, and leading so many others astray with his philosophies and doctrines and theology. 
I think one of the saddest uh, byproducts, if you will, of the theory of evolution is that it reduces our uh, status as human beings to uh, that of an animal. We did not evolve out of something that is less important. God created man on the sixth day, uh, created us separately, created us distinctly. Man may be excused for feeling some pride at having risen, though not through his own exertions, to the very summit of the organic scale. And the fact of his having thus risen may give him hopes for a still higher destiny in the distant future. The Bible said we were created a little lower than angels, which is much more noble and majestic than the explanation that evolution gives for who we are and what we are. We can create songs, we can write books, we can do these things to the glory of God. The Bible even says the angels can't have the same relationship that we can have with God. I do not believe that we are some sort of a highly evolved primate. I don't know how someone could observe humans and miss the dignity. That's put there by God alone. Man in his arrogance thinks himself a great work, worthy of the interposition of a deity, more humble and I believe truer, to consider him created from animals. The main conclusion that man is descended from some lowly organized form will, I regret, be highly distasteful to many. It has been asserted that man alone is capable of progressive improvement, that he alone makes use of tools, that no animal employs language, has a sense of beauty, the feeling of gratitude. But they are endowed with well-marked social instincts, parental and filial affections, and would inevitably acquire a moral sense or conscience as soon as intellectual powers had become nearly as well-developed as in man. To put man down as just an animal that were no different than a dog, a horse, an elephant, or a cat, or anything else, is totally preposterous. God made us in his image. And so to say that man is, a, is an animal, and God created man in his own image, so does one come back and say, are you saying God is nothing more than an animal? In the uh, seven years that it took Darwin to reach his murderous conclusion, his life changed completely. In 1839, he married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood. They had a marriage of 43 years, of great mutual respect, great tenderness. And that stayed the same, even though Darwin moved further and further away from Emma's beliefs um, and her, her Christian certainties. Eventually, they would have ten children, seven of whom survived into adulthood. Two years into their marriage, Charles and Emma moved here to Down House, 18 miles from London, where they would spend the rest of their lives together. Down House was far more important to Darwin as a scientific arena than the, than the Galapagos or even the whole of South America had been, because there he could settle down and get to work. In order to be a great scientist, you have to devote your entire life to science, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And Darwin did that. He worked manically. 
It was a constant pulse. Work hard, collapse. Work hard, collapse. Tick tock through the years. His house became a menagerie full of not just noisy, growing children, but of growing plants all over the place and noisy animals and dead and alive and boxes of things coming in the post and letters pouring through into the letterbox um, and all being presided over at home by the domestic goddess, which was Emma, freeing him to work hard in his study. She made an environment in which he could work obsessively on his big project for 20 years and more. He had greenhouses in which his gardener was cooperating with him in breeding programs on plants. He was collecting stuff coming in from all over the world. He was asking people to send him specimens which he would look at. His correspondence with other scientists across the world is gigantic. It's flabbergasting. Um, his letter writing and the letters he was getting back with people giving him evidence. He's writing to Muller in Brazil, can you give me evidence on um, these crabs which I believe exist on your shores? It's extraordinary. And he's collecting all this together, well aware that he will be attacked by religious people and by other scientists who think that this is fanciful. I determined to collect every sort of fact that could bear in any way on what are species, and have never ceased collecting facts. When he was working, he was not doing just one thing at a time. He was doing his species. He was dissecting all the barnacles in the world. He was keeping animal carcasses. He was doing experiments with flowers in the kitchen garden. He was raising pigeons, and on and on it went. He decided to make a collection of fancy pigeons because they showed the most extraordinary varieties created just in a few generations. He then compared them and crossbred them and all to explore how man can change organisms by selective breeding. If feeble man can achieve all these variations in so short a time by artificial selection, I can see no limit to the amount of change, to the beauty and infinite complexity which may be affected in the long course of time by nature's power of selection. He needed to gather the evidence, think through everything, and work it up into a theory that he could present for serious attention by fellow scientists. I have steadily endeavored to keep my mind free so as to give up any hypothesis, however much beloved, as soon as the facts are shown to be opposed to it. I feel within me an instinct for truth, there is only one truth, and truth is not an assimilation of information. But there's one truth, and that's found in the Bible. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If all we are is uh, a product of this random mutation process, then where does uh, morality come from? Where does hope come from? Where does love come from? Where, do, where does anything that makes us a human being really come from? I think Darwin was the first to understand where his ideas were leading him. He had no uh, illusions about how dangerous this work was or what conclusions it might lead to. Once grant that species may pass into each other and the whole fabric totters and falls, we allow planets, suns, whole systems of the universe to be governed by laws but the smallest insect we wish to be created at once by a special act with its instincts in place. Darwin says, no, we do not believe that God individually causes the planets to go in orbits. We should not believe that he individually creates animals and plants. These things take place by laws ordained to govern the creation. An innocent and good man stands under a tree and is killed by a flash of lightning. Do you believe that God designedly killed this man? 
or when a swallow snaps up a gnat, that God designed that? I can't and don't. Darwin's view is that God isn't really needed in the here and now. He may exist, he may well have designed and ordered creation, but he basically lets it go on its way. What that does, it puts God so remote <laughs> that we can safely ignore him. He's way back at the Big Bang and he really hasn't done much since. And here's another issue we need to think about. What's more basic to Christianity than prayer? Prayer is a case where we actually have an opportunity and are invited to do so by our Father uh, to speak to God. Why bother pursuing a relationship with God if he's, if he's closed the door on us and doesn't care about us anymore? To think that I had no communication with God would be so devastating. I can't even imagine uh, adopting such a view just to make peace with Darwin. If that's the way the world works, if it is just uh, this mechanical thing that God sets spinning in place, then you believe in a God that doesn't intervene in nature, that takes away any possibility of miracles, any possibility of answered prayer, any possibility of the resurrection. And in, uh, in reality, you take away the possibility of Christianity to be true at all. Christ Community Chapel started about 30 years ago with about 30 people gathering in a living room and from that we have grown to five different campuses that all operate as one church. We average a weekend attendance of probably around 4,000 to 4,500 people. Since the 1990s, the number of mega churches in the United States has increased fourfold. We have a lot of outreach going on overseas I think we are probably involved in 30 different countries. In the Middle East, in the Far East, across the world, in South America and Africa, here in the States. The only a growing branch of Christianity, I think, is uh, evangelical, biblical Christianity that is uh, faithful to the scriptures. I think people are longing for truth, for something that they can sink their teeth into, and that answers the deep questions of their souls. And that's what biblical Christianity is offering now. Everybody has to come up with a reason for the world being in, in the mess that, it, that it's in right now. Uh, that explanation for Christians happens in Genesis. Uh, the flood, everything in Genesis uh, plays itself out throughout the entire rest of the scripture. So if you take out or change Genesis to mean something else, to do something else, you uh, begin to eviscerate, to, to gut uh, the gospel message and the, the whole of Christianity. There is only one being that really knows you from cover to cover, knows everything you have ever done and every motive you have ever had, and then can deliver a verdict of whether you are okay or not okay, and that's God. God knows us intimately well, inside and out, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, uh, the number of hairs on my head, uh, and that's the privilege of having a relationship uh, with him, that he is in every aspect, uh, every part uh, of our movement day in and day out, and we have this living relationship with him. I can't imagine life without knowing that God has a plan and that that plan is not just for the here and now, but that plan includes a hope and a future, and a future way beyond whatever we'll face here on earth, but a future of him in heaven. When my boys were 10 and seven and two, I found out uh, after having a series of lumps and bumps in my body that I had ignored that I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I remember the dread in that doctor's eyes when he told me that it was stage three and possibly stage four. If I only had a few days to live, it would be hard. It would be difficult. There would be tears. 
but I would know without a shadow of a doubt that I have a faithful God who loves me and had a plan for me. We even shared with our boys that mommy could get sicker, and we tried to help them to know that if I did die, that God would still be God and that he would still be faithful. That was hard, but we, we did it in his strength. I was prostituting in every single street here in Akron, alleys, uh, abandoned houses, jumping in and out of cars with complete strangers, doing unthinkable um, sexual acts for money so that I was able to pay for crack. I smoked away every dream and hope to a point where I thought that I was just worthless. I started to use uh, marijuana in Vietnam. I started with that, and then I started to use um, opiates back when I got home, uh, morphine, and then that turned into heroin. And I soon have, found myself with a habit. And uh, that habit then became, became uh, the Lord of my life. And I remember one night being on Broad Street and I was screaming out to God to kill me or save me, but don't let me live like this anymore. It was a horrible place. And so I just very sincerely one night said, God, I, it's got to be more to life than this. And if you're real, would you make yourself real to me? He removed my addiction on the spot. He healed me. That's exactly what started uh, bringing me up out of that darkness. It was uh, the love that he has for me. It's amazing and I felt, I felt like a new creature. I know he's real. I know he lives within me and I know he's the best thing that, that ever happened to me and ever happened to this world. And now it's, it's my privilege to share that and proclaim that to every man, woman, boy, and girl. There's good news and there's hope. I would love to encourage Mr. Darwin and others that feel just like him to try God and see the transformation for themselves. If I were asked, what is the primary reason I believe evolution is incompatible with biblical Christianity? Uh, I could sum it up in one word for you, death. If you want, add pain, suffering, and death. I know a little about this. I lost my first wife to cancer, and now my second wife has cancer, and so do I. Whether we're young or old, uh, death is inevitable. And how do we deal with death? How does evolution deal with death? It was a question Darwin would have to face himself in his early 40s. He and Emma loved all their children, but there was one who was specially precious to them, their eldest daughter, Annie. Annie was a delightful child, pliable, amenable, loving, she loved to touch her parents, to be caressed, to be held, to plait their hair, to, to touch their arms. She was sensitive to their feelings. Just before her 10th birthday, Annie fell seriously ill. Darwin took her to the spa town of Malvern, and the doctor he credited with saving his own life when he was in a critical condition two years earlier. He left her there in the care of Dr. Gully and hurried back to Emma, who was heavily pregnant with their eighth child and in no condition to take the 150-mile journey from Downhouse to Malvern. Two weeks later, Darwin was summoned back to face an agonizing crisis. It is now, from hour to hour, a struggle between life and death. Oh, my own, it is very bitter indeed. Annie died at Easter, 1851. This was a watershed because Darwin no longer felt it possible afterwards to believe in a good, loving, Christian God. This is, for him, the final nail in his Christian coffin. Here's the conflict. God is good. God is all-powerful. 
horrific, catastrophic tragedy takes place. So how can all of these things be true? Abby's 17 years old, and she was in an automobile accident and has since been unable to regain the use of her legs. She's not able to breathe on her own or eat. I'm no doctor, but I think God would have to move for Abby to walk again. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. I'll praise the mount I'm fixed upon, it. mount of thy redeeming love. I wish one of us could sing. It would have been a really meaningful moment, you know? We can all sing. We just can't sing good. Yeah, I can. You can. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Abby was singing. You can She's sing like, good because we can't about? hear you. I was we heard it in music. We could harmonize. She's singing solo. We don't make any sense of this. I don't know how we could. We couldn't agree that she's done anything to deserve this. It's a horrible thing we're going through, but there is no way we could do it without God's presence. There's absolutely no way. We are so weak, but he is strong and he is holding us up every day. We don't understand the timing, but we do understand his presence. We know that all things will come to good. We don't know how. I can't understand how this could be for Abby's good. I trust that somehow it is. We have no doubt. God is a good God, a loving God. He will never leave us or forsake us. And he has a plan for her, and I firmly believe he is going to use her life as a testimony. And there already have been a lot of people touched by her. Heather, my wife, said, I, I'm praying and praying and praying for Abby, and nothing's happening and nothing's changing. Why would I pray to God? Who knows? The Lord may choose to be merciful. He might hear our cry and relent. But if he doesn't, no matter what happens, I still believe that God wants the best for his people. I don't know how people without God can survive things like this. I, I don't know how they could. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. For Darwin, there was no such consolation. There was no comfort to be had in a God who would reconcile him to his daughter in another life. Uh, or in the notion that there was a purpose to her death, and he was inconsolable. <laughs> He tried to avoid the pain of Annie's death by concentrating on his species theory, but there was a darkness that started to permeate his writing. Darwin was not a well man. Ever since he had begun working on evolution, because he knew what a disreputable thing he was doing, and yet he didn't intend to be disreputable. He was afraid of being misunderstood. It tore him apart. Emma was his protector. Emma made it possible for him to get on with what he cared most about, which was this, this enormous burden, this, this vision of nature, this vision of God's creation, which he was determined to put to the Victorian world and hope they would accept. On the Origin of Species was first published on November 24th, 1859. It's never been out of print since. People realized that when The Origin came out in November 1859, this was serious, substantial, and something to be reckoned with, and it sold out instantly. I think the most striking thing about the book, in fact, is that the reaction is much more muted and appreciative than I think legend would have it. This was not an idea that you could ignore because Darwin had presented it so well and with so much evidence that it demanded a verdict. And certainly within about five to 10 years, most educated people in Britain, including those of a religious persuasion, and quite often those of an orthodox religious persuasion, are convinced that species have evolved. In the United States, the book was published on the eve of the great 
civil war. And by the turn of the 20th century, evolution and its experts were well established in American higher education. It was one thing when scientists were just debating it among themselves. Well, you know, scientists are always theorizing about things. But when it was thrust upon you, when it was being taught to school kids uh, as, as the, you know, the, the, the cutting edge of science, that it really became a public uh, flashpoint. Evolution came under attack by a distinguished American politician named William Jennings Bryan. He believed evolution was un-American. He believed it was immoral, it was corrupting, and must not be taught to American school students. And Brian's crusade, it was called a crusade, really reached a climax in the summer of 1925 in a small town in Dayton, Tennessee, where a local school teacher was put up to admit that he had taught evolution in violation of a state statute. And so it happened. William Jennings Bryan prosecuted John Thomas Scopes for teaching evolution. Clarence Darrow, the great defense attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union, to defend Scopes from fundamentalism. So you suddenly you had this clash of these two you know, brilliant and famous uh, orators, Darrow and Bryant, and that was when it exploded into this huge media sensation. The Scopes trial it was a circus. Circus performers came and brought their chimpanzees. Uh, film crews showed up. Radio station had a live outside broadcast from the courtroom. And the issue was whether Brian and his popular constituency were to have jurisdiction over professional scientists. I am inclined to believe. The jury were mostly illiterate local gentlemen. There's no chimpanzee in my pedigree. The result of the Scopes trial was that Scopes was convicted and he was fined $100. But the real effect of the Scopes trial uh, was simply that uh, evolution largely disappeared uh, from, from public school science classes. And that's why the anti-evolution sentiment itself largely died down over the next few decades. If there was a single event that brought Darwin's theory back into the spotlight, it was the launch of Sputnik on the 4th of November, 1957. The cultural impact of Sputnik is hard to exaggerate. At that time, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the Cold War was just getting going, and people were very worried about this in the United States. They said, my God, the, you know, the, 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 the Russians beat us into space, and this was considered a, a serious indictment of the American educational system. We were falling behind in science. There was a renewed interest in science education as a result of this. And one effect of that renewed interest was redesigning curricula to be used in high school science classes. And this involved teaching advanced physics and it involved teaching evolution as the framework for understanding life sciences. When the Russians launched their Sputnik, it was a challenge to the scientific community, to the government of the United States. There was a panic in the scientific community of America. Hey, we're supposed to be leading edge here. We gotta catch up, we gotta get ahead. Science almost became God in our country. And so they started shoveling all kinds of money into scientific endeavors. But behind that all was this idea that Darwinism is correct also. The huge programs to bring biology teaching into the American school system awoke effectively something of a sleeping tiger. For the first time in history, Creationists fought back, using an entirely new tactic. They would fight science with science, orthodox science with creation science. The Bible reveals that God created all the animal and plant kinds in the beginning. And we're now learning that God placed a huge amount of information within each created kind, allowing them to diversify into the myriad of plants and animals we see today. This is not evolution, it's creation by an all-knowing, all-powerful, infinitely wise creator.
Further up, we see a massive grouping of galaxies called the Virgo Cluster. It contains over 2,000 galaxies and is 50 million light years away from Earth. Critics of the Bible have suggested that it is impossible for the light from these galaxies to reach Earth in only 6,000 years. But in fact, there are several different ways to get light to travel these distances in a short period of time. These include gravitational time dilation, alternate synchrony conventions, and others. Many scientists contend that dinosaurs died off over 60 million years before humans came to be. The possibility that humans and dinosaurs ever coexisted is unthinkable to them. But what does the Bible say? The Bible makes it very clear that God created land animals on day six. Dinosaurs were land animals. Therefore, Adam and Eve and dinosaurs lived hand in hand. They lived together. From just reading Genesis, you get the idea of a perfect world, no death, no disease. Animals, man, the dinosaurs were all vegetarian. Now, the fossil record, it's a record of death. It's a record of animals eating each other. It's a record of disease because there are dinosaur bones with brain tumors. But you can't have dinosaurs with brain tumors and dinosaurs eating each other until after sin. So if dinosaurs lived alongside humans, and Noah even brought pairs of young dinosaurs with him on the ark, what happened to them? Where did they all go? Well, dragon legends are found in many cultures and traditions all around the world. So it is hardly surprising that the world would be filled with legends of heroes like St. George and their encounters with mighty beasts. If the only way you can make your belief persist is to lie to children, which is what creationists do about the age of the earth and things of that nature, if that's the only way this thing can persist, it's not worth it. It should disappear. There is so much evidence to show that what Darwin saw in outline to be true is infinitely true on every single level. How miraculous it is that this man in the middle of the 19th century was able to see in broad outline what we can now see in infinite complexity. There's been so much advancement in science. You know, our understanding of DNA, the genome, our kinship with animals. If you are going to throw evolution away, you have to throw all of that away. We have eyes, we have ears. We were given those by God, potentially. Why would we have been misled? And not only us as individuals, but why would hundreds of thousands, millions of people that have taken these set questions very seriously, why would they all have been misled as well? We're very aware of how much evolution is taught in the public school setting, so that's why we like to homeschool. Can you show me on the timeline where he is? He's right here okay. on the timeline. Okay. And what... What word that we use today came from his name? In modern English, martyr means somebody who's killed for the sake of Christ. We do need to shield our kids from what's going on in the world and help them to be able to defend their faith. Gladiator fights, dramas, and as a slaughtering house for Christians who would not deny Jesus. So all of these people were witnessing the slaughter of multiple Christians and watching gruesome things such as gladiators fighting each other to the death. I'm sure that they will be attacked when they go out into the world when they're older and they're in the workforce. One of our children is very interested in science. Nero was the first emperor to start the major persecution of the Christians. We warn our son that he there are going to be many people who are not going to agree that God created this world in six literal days. They're going to tell him it's a fairy tale. He needs to have strong faith and believe God's word to be able to defend that later. It used to be that uh, there, were, there was a three-legged stool. Uh, the family taught what the schools taught, what the church taught. Uh, now you have, uh, in our church, you have families and church teaching one thing, and you have schools teaching another thing. 
oftentimes when I'm dealing with young people, especially people who are about to graduate out of high school, go off to college, um, I tell them that they're going to um, face significant opposition to what they believe as far as their understanding and love for the Word of God. You read headlines and you watch television, and the overwhelming current is belief in evolution. Are you threatened by it, or do those do those arrows kind of do they wear do they wear you down? I absolutely believe that God had a controlling hand over my creation and over the creation of the earth and the creation of all things. Um, and there's nothing that the secular world can say to shake that. I was raised and I believe that the Bible is fact, so if something's going to collide with it, then it's obviously incorrect and false. I think sometimes our culture has like a overly hev hev heavy reliance on like science. Christianity is, is more than science and scientific proof. Have you guys ever been in a, a situation where you've been articulating your faith and it was met with mockery? It should never surprise us that we we're mocked or hated by the world. I mean, Christ said that this would happen and it's happening, so. I have to say, and I'm willing to say, you know, that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are, are true and correct because it's, it's, it's God's word. You know, if one could imagine Darwin sitting down in that, you know, lovely sunny garden with those young people, I think he would quite quickly engage them in a, in a much more interesting series of conversations um, about the world and about being and the nature of creation and evolution and so on, which I'm sure they would find absolutely fascinating, but he wouldn't be giving them the answers. He would be asking them questions. Darwin himself never stopped asking questions about his science and about God. In my most extreme fluctuations, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. I feel most deeply that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might just as well speculate on the mind of Newton. It was the final humble admission from one of the greatest minds of all time. On April 26, 1882, thousands gathered here at Westminster Abbey for the funeral of Charles Darwin. The American ambassador, Russell Lowell, was one of the pallbearers. Reflecting on Darwin's life, the Bishop of Carlisle told the mourners there need be no conflict between the study of nature and belief in God.